Today we'll talk about uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy again for the for the last time of this course. And this year we're um, combining uh, anti-metabolites, alkylators, and planting agents. So um, it'll allow more time for targeted therapies and cellular therapies down the road. So I've, I met most of you. My name is Mike, and I work out of you know the hematology, stem cell transplant, and cellular therapy groups. I'm uh, mostly inpatient, but also in clinic, so I'll likely see a lot of you around. Okay, so today review the mechanisms of action, um, chemotherapy related adverse effects, and um, supportive care strategies for patients treated with cytotoxic chemotherapy. Uh, covering 31 drugs today, um, 15 of the agents are in alkylating and platinating agents. And really between the 31 drugs, there's really about 10 that we'll use commonly. So I'll try to point those out and focus on, on those as much as possible. Alkylating agents were discovered um, during war processes. So sulfa mustards um, played a role in um, development of these chemotherapies. They, the sulfa mustard was noted to shrink lymphoid tissue on, you know, autopsies from the, the battlefield. And then these two relatively famous, uh, Goodman and Gilman out of Yale University, pretty famous pharmacologists in the U.S. had worked on this during the war in the early 40s. And by the end of the, the World War II, they had mechlorethamine ready to go for, for treating patients. There is six different classes of alkylating drugs, and it really shows a lot of creativity and ingenuity on um, design. So we have the sulfa mustard analog um, that were discovered after the war. Uh, Azeridiums, which were rational drug design, like just around the pure cation, like making the best electrophile possible. Alkyl phonates, which are um, really kind of derivatives from like soaps actually, but pure organic chemistry, the best SN2 reaction we can get. Nitrosureas were just a random National Cancer Institute screening that showed weak activity. Uh, triazines were initially developed as antimetabolites and then methylhydrazines were um, screened for depression, uh, use in depression and mood disorders and they found anti-cancer effect uh, during the screening. Platinating agents were discovered in, in California, Linus Pauling. Um, it was an accidental discovery and um, they've been very effective drugs. So looking at all 15 of the agents here uh, by class, and then you see the approval dates all the way back to the 1950s. Um, pointing out here that really the, like as far as number of treatment plans, cyclophosphamide, carboplatin, and cisplatin have by far the most number of treatment plans. Cyclophosphamide, for a number of reasons, is the most commonly used alkylating agent. And then carboplatin, um, cisplatin, and oxaliplatin are all, all pretty widely used. Those numbers on the, the far right are number of patients treated per year. And then you'll see there's something for everyone with the, the dot teams that use these drugs. So um, GIGU, gyne, head, neck, lung, melanoma, sarcoma. Um, the liquid tumor side, uh, all, almost all uh, teams use use these drugs. So this was, you know, this is an early era. Like these are old toys that we played with a lot. Um, they're still um, very necessary. Like we're probably never going to get rid of cytotoxic chemotherapy, although it's definitely been shrinking over time. Uh, it's really important to note that several of the curative intent treatment plans still include alkylating agents or platinating agents. So as of now, we're between 20 and 25% of all of our adult cores um, and containing these, these agents. So we have over a thousand treatment plans um, for the cancer center now. Um, really simply, it's just alkylating agents are a compound capable of covalent binding um, under physiological conditions. So DNA, many sites in DNA are nucleophile rich and they um, allow for this, you know, the 
classic SN2 reaction where an electrophile is displaced um, and the compounds are stable enough at physiological condition to create this covalent bond. So essentially then three things happen, either um, fragmentation of DNA and R or RNA, um, a mispairing of nucleotides. So here you'll have um, like guanine and thiamine is actually has three hydrogen bonds. So it's, even though this is the incorrect pairing, it's more stable than the CG bond. Uh, and then we'll have cross-linking of DNA, either interstrand, inter, um, interstrand or protein cross-linking. Uh, and all this will lead to um, problems with replication. Um, so black box warnings, uh, kind of with both the alkylating and the NMO tablet uh, agents, so really want to show just kind of the diversity and the of end organ effect. There's there are class effects for sure, but uh, there are also many um, the many agents that impact an organ system that you may or may not expect. So it's kind of good to expect really everything and, and know the package inserts the what are the black box warnings, especially, and then even the warnings and precautions. Uh, here, so myelosuppression is a is a very large effect here. Um, secondary cancers are common. Uh, hypersensitivity reactions, which uh, we'll talk about management of. Um, experienced provider, so we're not going to be doing these in a you know smaller remote clinics. And then even medication error prevention. So for that one, for example, lomustine is given once every six weeks. Um, it's recommended to dispense just one dose at a time, so there's not uh, errors in over overdosing. So we've had cases where a three month supply was dispensed and it was all taken at, at the same time. And so that's why it's a black box warning for that. Um, this will kind of go into a little bit more detail on the, the organ systems. Um, so 34 warnings and precautions for these 15 drugs. Um, encephalopathy with ifosamide is due to the um, metabolism of ifosamide and should be should be followed closely. Cisplatin is is well known as a neuropathic a, a drug that causes neuropathy, um, peripheral neuropathy, and central neuropathies. Um, Busulfan was our first chemotherapy shown to be directly toxic to lung tissue, so pulmonary fibrosis has to be followed. Um, for that, um, hepatotoxicity, decarbazine, which is not used very much anymore, but um, had uh, liver failure and, and still still does at a low incidence. Um, for GI toxicity, the platinine agents are just extremely nauseating inducing. Um, so those have to be watched. We'll still have admissions to the hospital for patients that do not have nausea control with platinine agents. Um, nephrotoxicity, so cisplatin is a real classic uh, renal toxic drug. Um, hemorrhagic cystitis with ifosamide. Myelosuppression, again, you see all 15 agents are, are linked to that. Um, very importantly, 100% of alkylating agents have secondary cancer is either a black box warning or a, um, a warning and precaution. And then hypersensitivity is also very common for these drugs. We'll dive into some of the specific um, adverse effects. So neutropenia is, you know, across the whole spectrum. And we really use these principles to um, treat cancers, the onset, the nadir recovery. So one of the reasons cyclophosphamide is used so commonly is it just has a really beautiful, very consistent onset of neutropenia, nadir of neutropenia and recovery. So we can use this drug every three weeks very consistently. We can tell patients to be ex, you know, extremely safe the second week of the therapy. Um, it just has a really, really nice um, uh, kinetics. Melphalan and carmustine um, we'll use in tr the tra transplant processes, busulfan as well. Um, we really, really like that deep myelosuppression that's really long. It gives the um, transplanted cells uh, time to engraft and and uh, find space within the bone marrow. So those are those drugs are are used in that that setting. Um, 
some of these drugs are are more selective than others. Like one thing I guess to call out would use sulfan. Um, for whatever reason, is very selective for myeloid precursor cell toxicity. And we nobody knows why that is yet. Um, there's a lot of mystery still with cytotoxic drugs, and these kind of mechanisms are not being studied as much as they used to be. Um, so I don't know if we'll ever find an answer, but it's really interesting that you'd, you'd really only be treating myeloid disorders with, with that drug. Um, so in NCCN, we have, they have a table of um, regimens that are associated with uh, neutropenia, neutropenic fever especially. So neutropenia alone is not necessarily a problem, but neutropenic fever um, can really get people into trouble. And so here I highlight both the platinum agents and the alkylating agents and how uh, commonly, um, you can see how commonly these drugs are associated with neutropenic fever. Neutropenic fever is a common reason for hospital admission um, when patients come in, we have to assess whether or not they're on growth factor for primary prophylaxis. Um, generally, if the risk of neutropenic fever is greater than 20%, all of our regimens are built with growth factor um, as required. If the risk of neutropenic fever is 10 to 20%, we'd call that intermediate risk. And generally, those regimens are built with the option to give growth factor. And so patients may or may not give it, get it. Um, secondly, um, patients may get long acting growth factor. That's usually good for 21 or sorry, 14 days. And so, um, we do not need to restart a short acting growth factor for a inpatient admission. If they're on the long acting products until roughly day 14, sometimes we will start as early as 12 if they're severely neutropenic. And then if they're not on primary prophylaxis, again, most of these patients are going to be on an intermediate regimen where it was chosen not to give it. Um, we assess the patient-specific risk factors, so older age, sepsis, severe ANC, and you'll see, you know, you'll see ANC of zero in a lot of these patients. Um, prolonged neutropenia, where you expect recovery to be more than 10 days. If they have pneumonia on admission, invasive fungal infection. If they're hospitalized with a, you know, at the time of the fever. And then prior episodes. And generally, moving forward, we'd add prophylaxis to the next cycle of therapy. Um, and if it's very severe, we may consider switching the chemo regimen to something else. We do have an order set for neutropenic fever that includes a lot of, a lot of great items, um, the antibiotics themselves, of course, but then like follow-up cultures. And then there's a clinical practice guideline as well that you can find. Moving on to nausea and vomiting. Um, so this is our, our UW guideline. This is based on NCCN and ASCO and ESMO materials. Um, again, highlighting how uh, toxic these drugs are. So of the high emesis drugs, um, all but one are either alkylating agents or platinum agents. And of the moderate drugs, uh, more than half are, are from this class. So very important to prevent nausea vomiting up front and then treat it um, as it comes up. Uh, we have built into all our treatment plans um, medications to to um, prophylax against nausea vomiting, um, and we'll, we base this as well on on high risk, moderate risk, or low risk. Some tips for managing nausea, and a lot of these are are very effective and not necessarily tried before patients. Um, like, you don't necessarily go through all this education uh, before a patient runs into, into the weeds. I, you know, you, you try as much as you can, but a lot of times there's low hanging fruit that you can really make a huge difference. Um, so taking chemo at bedtime on an empty stomach is routinely a, a helpful. Um, extend the period of uh, antimedic pre-medication. So instead of four days, you might go to six or seven days. Uh, instruct patients to avoid large meals, so usually eating six smaller things, so like having an apple and then having, you know, a piece of bread and um, a rice dish. You know, spreading the stuff throughout the day is very helpful. Um, lozenges are chewing gum. There's also like a ginger um, chews uh, can be helpful. The next cycle of therapy will generally increase the anemetic prophylaxis. And then... 
in the palliative intense setting, we can divide the doses. Um, we don't like to do that. We don't do it very common, commonly, but it is something um, in our pocket to use. And dietitians are, are very helpful. Nutritionists are very helpful as well. Um, so there's a lot of guidelines out there for, for nausea management, and some of them are relatively patient friendly. So there's this, the health facts for you is um is not too not too bad it's a, a good thing to use and then um asco the patient information and in asco I, I like a lot as well moving on to neurotoxicity so um encephalopathy black box warning from ifosamide uh ifosamide is not you know as you saw was not commonly used so this this drug is something that not everyone will will see um so this results from uh, chloroacetaldehyde uh, accumulation and depletion of the electron transport chain. Um, it is definitely less than 10% of patients receiving ifosamide. We probably have a case, one case per year, and it rarely occurs with these other drugs. We've seen it once with that OTEPA, for example, over, over many years of practice here. Um, so with ifosamide, it's usually used for patients with relapsed cancer. So we generally know these patients pretty well. We've seen them for months to years before they get ifosamide. We often have a really good baseline of their mental status, um, unless they're a patient that's transferred from, you know, an outside hospital, which, which can be challenging. Um, but generally this is really dramatic. Like it's, you know, they'll change from being a highly functioning human with you know loving caring person to somebody that's um, really really hard to um it's a hard effect to see just major mood lability issues and, and changes in arousal um onset we will generally see this in the hospital patients are hospitalized for ifosamide so we'll usually see it before they discharge but um so i would say that 95 percent of cases we see before they discharge but um, once in a while, you'll get a case presenting um, from out, outside and we'll have to admit them right away to, to treat. These risk factors are almost always present. There's usually at least two of the risk factors present when this reaction occurs. Um, the last patient had low albumin and liver LFT issues. Um, yeah, so you stop the ifosamide and usually consider methylene blue. It restores the metabolic pathway. Um, it, and then it also prevents formation of the toxic agent or the toxic uh, metabolic me metabolite. Treatment dose is 50 mg IV every four hours and then recovery time. Usually, some people snap out of it um, by 24 hours, but it's usually somewhere around 36 hours. And if we treat again with uh, ifosamide, we'll do secondary prophylaxis. Uh, we really won't use that unless it, like they recovered relatively quickly from the initial insult. This is what the toilet looks like. It actually, um, when people pee, so you gotta kinda let them know about this as well. Um, peripheral neuropathy, so very, very common with our platinum agents. Um, there's concepts of both acute and persistent. So acute usually resolves within 14 days patients will kind of tell us exactly when it's gonna come on and then resolve so you know they'll know for sure like day eight nine it's gonna come on and then should be gone by day 11. um if that's their pattern some people will have it day two three and then it'll it'll disappear after a week or so but um um, it uh, can be a dose limiting toxicity. Um, if you look at the grading of peripheral neuropathy, so, you know, if, if you can't take care of yourself, if you can't button your shirt, if you can't brush your teeth, if you can't open food to, to eat at home, um, that can severely uh, limit your options for therapy. Um, persistent may or may not be reversible. Uh, there's, you know, people will live with this for, for years and years after after full fox treatment after BEP treatment, um, so they'll have um, deficits that they'll have to get used to. Kind of wearing different shoes, they might have to change their house around to have less common 
um, you know, have, have the surfaces be more uh, stable and consistent, um, et cetera. Uh, ASCO updated their guidelines in 2020. They haven't updated since. Um, they usually update these every five to seven years. And there's been a lot of study on this uh, adverse effect without a lot of good options. Duloxetine has shown effect, especially for platinum agents. So taxanes, it's not as, the effect is not as strong, but so it is, it is definitely the first um, line recommendation for, for a platinum related um, peripheral neuropathy. And the effect is not super great. It's usually, patients will usually mention 25 to even 50% better, but um, to be honest, a lot of times that is enough to really, really help patients uh, do things they enjoy. So, and then there is not great handouts for this. Um, they, I guess the handouts are just very wordy, very lengthy. There's not like a lot of pictures on them. It is good to have all this information. Um, it, it definitely like is a type of adverse effect that affects patients differently. But um, this stuff is out there and, and should be should be given to patients for sure. Um, so yeah, people have had to put up handrails. They've you know got rid of their loose rugs, um, rubber mats in the shower. Um, be really careful with water, so pe people can't tell that the water's too hot to get burned because they they cannot sense the temperature. Um, dishes that you you'll commonly hear patients that broke broke dishes. Um, yeah, so really a lot of more, this is the hardest is like, you know, people that enjoy using their hands for their hobbies. So people that knit, um, people that paint, um, it really, really can impact them. And they'll, they've even told us, oh, can I switch chemo to anything else but this? I just, I really like knitting is very important to me. So um, it's a, a, a good, good thing to have discussions with. Moving on, pulmonary toxicity, bucelfan is the first chemo where lung, direct lung toxicity was uh, described. And, you know, everyone that gets bucelfan is going to have some pulmonary toxicity. Um, the uh, problem with this is like the onset, it takes a long time. So the last really bad adverse effect we had with this, the patient had been two years since the chemotherapy. And not a lot of stuff works. Um, it's pretty pretty frustrating for the patient. Um, we, you know, we'll try steroids, but it, it generally is, is a challenge. So, um, something to follow, something to follow long-term. It's, it's not something that usually comes on quickly. Uh, cardiovascular, I just wanted to mention how many, whoops, sorry. The, you know, the items in, in red here are, are, uh, package insert warnings and precautions, and then the items in black are the black box warnings. So, a real uh, panoply of like of cardiovascular adverse effects. Um, there's not, um, you know, fibrosis, heart block, arrhythmias, heart failure, um, and some of these are from overdoses, but most of them are standard of care care dosing. So. Uh, really good heart follow-up for essentially all patients that get alpha lipid agents um, is is a good idea. Make sure the primary care doctor is aware to to watch for heart failure and and screen for these things. Uh, liver toxicity. So we have renal occlusive disease, which is a another rare problem. Um, there's a like uh, I would say maybe we have one to two patients. Um, every two years with this. So like we'll go a full year without having a case and then have two in a year or so. Um, and this is kind of, you know, this is kind of true of set of toxic drugs. Like there's a lot of these adverse effects are, are, are rare, but they're very serious. So um, uh, read up on them whenever, whenever you come across them, but weight gain, right upper quadrant pain, um, and then increasing the LFTs is a classic triad of this um, it definitely usually occurs early on in transplant. We tr give patients Ursadiol as an attempt to prophylax this um, adverse effect. And we'll, um, if you're going to see resolution, it'll take weeks. It's not going to, it's not going to solve itself within 24 to 48 hours. Um, and then only not a hundred percent of patients respond. So that's, um, I would say our response rates 
probably closer to 75%, but, um, and then the fibrotide is a, you know, very high cost treatment. It's every four hours. It only the drug itself only lasts for, for three hours before it expires. So there's a lot of like clinical, um, like nursing, pharmacy coordination to, to make sure this drug is given appropriately. Then it'll suppress platelets. These patients often already have platelet issues. So you really gotta watch for bleeds. Um, we do have a, a clinical practice guideline on, on this. VOD is more common in pediatrics. So um, it'll and more, you know, the rate will be double or triple in pediatric patients. Uh, hemorrhagic cystitis, um, another um, rare adverse effect, but something that needs to be watched. So essentially the acrolein accumulation is tough on the bladder. So bladder edema, ulceration, and then bleeding. Um, so any dose of bifosamide, we have to use mesna, which is a rescue or, you know, protective agent, supportive care agent. Um, high dose cyclophosphamide sometimes, and then chronic oral cyclophosphamide, which we don't use much anymore, but um, it can be considered there as well. So urgency, frequency, you know, these patients will be peeing, wanting to pee every single hour, uh, burning cessation, um, blood, and um, it, it can progress to the point of hemodynamic instability. So here's the you know, imaging for this and the CT scan showing the edema of the bladder wall. Uh, so the main uh, focus here is to prevent this from happening. And so aggressive hydration, uh, generally 150 an hour of some sort of fluid um, to minimize the exposure. We try not to give these drugs at nine o'clock at night where patients go to bed and sleep all night. Um, we really prefer to get them, you know, earlier in the day. Uh, Mesna covalent binds acrolein. Um, it can be, um, it's always, always used with ifosamide. That's because the acrolein metabolite is much higher in ifosamide than cyclophosphamide. It can be up to five fold. Um, mesna exposure with ifosamide versus cyclophosphamide. And then mesna is both IV and oral. And so we can, we can send patients home with mesna. Um, sometimes we run into insurance issues. So we always have to check insurance coverage before, before doing that. And most of these patients have good enough performance status to tolerate the high dose IVF, but not all of them do. So we really have to be careful with that. Here's the chemistry of this. So with cyclophosphamide, you'll have um, at most one acrolein. Uh, and ifosamide, it just requires a lot of metabolism to get to an active drug. So you can have up to fivefold the acrolein exposure. Another reason we really, really like cyclophosphamide because the metabolism is very clean and there's a lot of inactive um, drugs that don't, inactive uh, metabolites that really don't have an effect on the body. Our ifosamide regimens are built to help us with, with all of this. So they're built with the high dose IVF. They are built with a UA with microscopy for checking um, before ifosamide is given and then the day after ifosamide is given. There's treatment parameters to the nurses to notify the prescriber if there's any, there's trace or higher um, blood. Um, here, this regimen is using 200 mils an hour. Um, and then Mesna is built in one to one with ifosamide to give continuously with Mesna for the, for this particular regimen. And all ifosamide regimens will have something to this effect, and some of our high dose uh, cyclophosphamide regimens will. Uh, direct um, renal toxicity. So this is another um, mechanism that's somewhat understood, but not not really. So oxidative stress, inflammatory response. Um, the really high incidence for cisplatin, especially when you get to higher doses, like 120 mg per meter squared in some of the sarcoma regimens and such. Um, so, I, yeah, you'll, like, if um, you're checking labs the first week, they're flying through, that's very common, actually. You don't really see problems with cisplatin until the second week. Um, 
we um like it, it'll kind of come out of nowhere too you're like oh what the heck i thought this guy was doing great and then then they'll their um kidney function will will be impacted so um so magnesium supplementation is is pretty commonly needed if they're going to have achai from cisplatin um we try not to dose reduce but sometimes you really have to um, especially after four or five um, cycles of cisplatin and um, risk factors so older people renal impairment baseline uh, really screen the patients for other nephrotoxic drugs you don't want these patients on ibuprofen or naproxen uh, any anything like that and then hydration is associated with better outcomes so um, some of these patients will bring in for bring into the infusion center at the clinic for a bolus of fluids a couple of days after after their cisplatin, especially if they have AKI with their with their first cycle. Um, so here is the FDA um, our package insert um, based guidance for just melphalan and cisplatin and oxaliplatin, I guess, carboplatin. Um, these drugs are old, and back in the 50s and 60s, the FDA was not requiring um, um, renal dosing in the package insert. And so a lot of the older drugs still don't have anything in their package insert, and we're relying on really small trials to, to uh, um, make these recommendations. Um, Bendamustine was approved in 2008, so they, they were pretty well studied, and I um, I think a lot of these drugs would have stronger recommendations to hold if if they were approved more recently uh, like bendamustine like it's a pretty hard um to hold the drug if planning clearance is less than 40. um but when you know you reach out to pharmacy for these kind of recommendations i think just kind of uh just keep in mind that the data behind a lot of these is pretty pretty weak and so really assessing the patient in front of you and their risk and whether or not there's a viable alternative and whether um, if they did have kid injury, what would it mean for them? Uh, it's important to think about because the data we have to, to support these reductions is, is very, very limited. Uh, I think this is the last one for aplodinian. So hypersensitivity, um, carboplatin it would be the poster child for this. Um, it's usually uh, type one. Um, hypersensitivity it comes on really quickly within minutes a lot of times um the you, you i i haven't seen like severe problems with this of course but you, you can certainly be hospitalized um and uh it, but the drugs we have to rescue patients from this hypersensitivity or work really well it, they should um you know, within a within 15 minutes, the patient should be stabilized and doing doing well. Um, that's a knock on wood, of course. Like you really want to make it a priority. Um, so, uh, and if this were to happen, um, you wouldn't rechallenge with a normal dosing. You'd have to kind of uh, desensitize the patient to the therapy. We do have a um, guideline for this and. I don't have these symptoms and the best emergency medicines to administer memorized. So I, this is the guideline that I actually save in my favorites. Um, like you can star items on Uconnect and access, you know, like access them quickly. And so if that's something you want to do, go for it. it, um, it this kind of uh, guidance is actually, actually pretty good. These, we, we followed this now for several years and it, it works pretty well. Um, then we actually have a desensitization uh, treatment plan for carboplatin. So you don't have to enter all these orders yourself. Um, it's, we, you know, we go through solution A, B, and C, and it takes the better part of a day in clinic to get through this, but after patients are desensitized, they can safely receive uh, carboplatin therapy. There's a lot of dosage forms, so intracavitary, topical, implant wafers for carmustine for, for brain cancer, um, intracavitary for thiotepa, so if we were for pleural fusions or um, we're, we're using that. So, um, and be really careful, like with uh, bioavailability of these drugs, it's their PO dosing is often very different than IV.
um, la, uh, like drug drug interactions. The kind of the key point here is that there is no real theme across the class, and so if you're concerned about it, um, look look it up and and uh, um, you'll see here. So like. Ben and Mustang will definitely have, this is probably the most common where we try to change therapy. So, you know, we, we don't want uh, Ben and Mustang, um, follicular patients on omeprazole, like it, it's not gonna be effective. Um, and these <laughs> don't necessarily flag. So it's, it's important to really, really think about this, I guess, as far as um, if your patients are going to be on the therapy for many, many months, just to really understand their drug drug interactions, use sulfan will, you know, posiconazole is a very common medication for these patients. And so we want to make sure there's a decent washout period, at least three days for the pharmacodynamic effect to wash out with, um, posiconazole. And so, yeah, I, I, even me, I still kind of look this stuff up, uh, just because I, I know that there, there's no class effect. I'll pause quickly. Any questions on alkalinating agents and platinating agents? We'll go into antimetabolites. Okay. Um, so 16 drugs in antimetabolites. Again, about five of them are, are more commonly used. So we'll try to focus on those five. Um, methotrexate uh, was the first antimetabolite in 1947, Dana-Farber in Boston. So Boston is a very active area for early cytotoxic chemo, um, or New England, I guess. Um, the, um, um, uh, the methotrexate was the first drug to, to treat a, a metastatic cancer and cure a metastatic cancer. So that's kind of cool. Uh, here's our agents. There's four classes of drugs, and so you'll treatment plan wise: uh, methotrexate, fludarabine, hepcidabine, cytarabine, 5 fu and gemcitabine are the in the most prolific treatment plans. And then, as far as patients treated, methotrexate, capecitabine, you know, mostly due to you know its use in breast and GI cancers. Um, 5 fu uh, again, GI cancer is very common and gemcitabine are, are the most commonly used drugs by far. Um, this slide is, is really just kind of showing that essentially you're inhibiting some sort of enzyme in the uh, DNA RNA process or uh, directly um, interfering with the DNA RNA process. So we'll have a variety of mechanisms and a variety of, of ways to get to where we're going. But um, to be honest, it's it's um, really only two real real mechanisms. So methotrexate uh, inhibits two different enzymes involved in DNA metabolism. For example, um, thioguanine will be you know just simply an analog of guanine that um, that directly inhibits uh, DNA RNA synthesis. So um, uh, pretty cool. There's a lot of a lot of different ways to get there and. Um, um, a lot of variety in, in the drugs. Uh, again, black box warning. So methotrexate has the record for the most black box warnings of any medication that's been FDA approved. So it has 14 black box warnings. You'll see again that all organ systems are really part of this uh, uh, process for um, black box warnings. Um, so we'll go kind of head to toe again here quickly. So neurotoxicity, um, seizures with cladribine and fludarabine, um, have to, have to be watched. And as long as we prophylax that and, and do good patient selection, it really hasn't, hasn't been too much of a problem. Um, pulmonary toxicity with, uh, methotrexate, uh, hepatotoxicity, uh, cytarabine, higher doses, you can see hepatotoxicity. GI toxicity, um, cytarabine, methotrexate, um, nausea can be a, can be an issue. Um, mucositis can be an issue. Nephrotoxicity, methotrexate. Uh, myelosuppression is again a class effect, so across the board. Infection, uh, derm toxicity, so skin skin damage uh, can be really severe with um, methotrexate toxicity. 
um, hypersensitivity, injection site reactions, radiation recall, which is um, an unpleasant effect for patients for sure. Uh, secondary cancers are, are still there, but not as common as the alpha living agents, which again, 100% of the agents cause secondary cancer. Uh, I'll have a couple of slides on methotrexate. Methotrexate um, is, you know, one of the more common used drugs, but uh, it is used in both the solid side and, and the heme side, but um, generally not a lot of you are going to be seeing this commonly. So it's just more of a story of how, how we protect uh, um, patients from a really cytotoxic drug. So again, there's two mechanisms of action for, for methotrexate. Both of these essentially deplete um, the stores of molecules capable of forming DNA and RNA. So we're depleting the building blocks of DNA and RNA with methotrexate. Um, it's oral and IV, so high dose methotrexate is greater than 500 megs per meter squared, and that um, needs to follow our high dose process, which we have a clinical practice guideline for. All patients are admitted inpatient for this. Um, so delayed methotrexate clearance, uh, there's risk factors for it, low albumin, kid, um, liver dysfunction, third spacing. So we assess all of these before we even start the therapy. Um, this data is from our patients actually, and um, morbid obesity was uh, was shown to have you know over thirty percent incidence of a AKI. Um, drug drug interactions we have to watch. We watch these every single day. Pharmacy notes we do um, look at look at this every day. Um, here's our platform for methotrexate. So we build our our treatment plans and work with nursing um, uh, and and physicians to to make sure this is safe. Uh, patients are checking urine pages three times a day. We try not to wake them up, of course, um, but it, it can be kind of painful because they're on um, a pretty high uh, IV fluids and have to go to the bathroom pretty commonly. So, um, but yeah, we're checking urine page commonly. We're starting leucovoran at an appropriate time. We're doing notes. Um, we're checking methotrexate levels. We're checking kidney function. Based on these results, we have an algorithm to adjust either fluids or adjust um, leucovorin or even think about adjusting future doses. Um, so leucovorin, up to 25, it's okay to give orally, but after that, you have to do it IV because it's, um, it's not absorbed beyond 25 milligrams. Leucovorin does not increase methotrexate clearance, so it's, it, it is just providing those building blocks for purine and pyrimidine synthesis. It's not um, clearing methotrexate at all. It's just kind of getting around it by giving the building blocks back. And we continue the chlorine until methotrexate is less than 1.0. Um, glucarpidase, this is a like a, a lot of info here, and we only use this six times in the last five years. Um, every time we use it, you kind of go to the policy and look look this up. Um, so I don't, you know, definitely not be memorizing this, but just realize that there's a fair amount to it. Essentially, we we do have this in house. We don't have to order it. We cap the dose at at two vials. Um, we you have to adjust the leucovorin times, and um, uh, uh, watch the patient closely. Like the the methotrexate levels after this drug are not necessarily adequate, like accurate. And so you're watching the other patient adverse effects, so skin toxicity, liver toxicity, GI toxicity, neurotoxicity, um, during that process, during that time where you're waiting for methotrexate to fully clear. Um, okay, six uh, MP is a you know has a, um, a metabolism with a couple different. Uh, um, Gene. So T, like TPMT is a as an enzyme clears uh, 6MP, and there's variation in in human genetics for what level of TPMT we have. Xanthine oxidase, so allopurinol um, blocking that would not ideally not be used with 6MP. Um, we routinely test TPMT at UW, and we'll see these heterozygous deficiency or homozygous deficiency. So heterozygous is 10% of patients. And then one in 400 is homozygous deficiency. 
For those patients, we actually reduced the dose of 6-MP by 90%, and we'll just give it Monday, Wednesday, Friday at a relatively low dose. Um, the intermediate um, deficiency patients will cut the dose usually 50 to, to 50 to 60% of, of what it is, and then adjust it from there. We can increase it um, sometimes up to 75%. And you'll see the lollipop um, design with the uh, missense mutation for TPMT. Um, with, I guess, it, you know, if you have this mutation and you get the drug, you have like mild suppression is out of control. It's usually, we'll see patients with A and Z of zero. Um, and then all patients will have increased risk for secondary cancers too. Uh, so this, this is a summary of the purine analogs. Um, so pyrimidine analogs, so capecitamine, a really, really commonly used drug, the most commonly used antimetabolite. Hand foot syndrome can be can be an issue, um, and it'll it'll look like this at a you know an earlier grade. Um, so ibuprofen can work. Um, like really watching, you know, the, probably the worst case I had was somebody some guy that went home and chainsawed for the whole weekend, and then just his hands were just chewed up. Um, so watching that, like reducing uh, friction on your hands and feet is is a real key part of this. Um, moisturizing creams for hands and feet, um, like they have, like commonly like thought about as like otter cream, uh, is a is a um, a recommendation we can give for for these patients. Uh, mucositis also happens with with capecitabine, so we have many suggestions for preventing mucositis or for treating it. Probably our our favorite is just normal saline rinses. So. Four times a day, rinse with normal saline, rinse your mouth. It'll help the help the bacteria. Um, we do have doxepin mouthwash that that can be used. Uh, patients that get more severe mucositis um, will end up using opioids. Um, just you know, we we try um, to once the mucositis resolves to to taper off opioids, of course. Uh, and then cryotherapy for malfunction patients, we will give uh, ice chips for 30 minutes um, um, before the chemo and, and during. And then bolus of a few, we, we don't commonly use, to be honest, just because it's too much mucositis. So we just kind of omit the boluses usually. A DPYD is another, another gene, so another enzyme uh, that can be deficient. And so three to 6% of people have this deficiency and we don't routinely test for this yet. There is more testing capability. I, I still think we, you know, probably in the next couple of years we'll be testing at all patients for this. Uh, but this is a, um, you know, it metabolizes both 5-FU and capecitabine. So capecitabine is a, a prodrug of 5-FU. And without uh, this enzyme, uh, patients cannot uh, metabolize the drug, and it uh, leads to toxic metabolite and severe toxicity. So cytopenia is really, it'll be pancytopenic. Mucositis will be really bad. Um, diarrhea, you know, up to grade four diarrhea where you're having liters of diarrhea a day. Um, and then it, there will be patients admitted for this. Um, the, the test is kind of a... Um, it takes a couple of weeks to come back, so we will sometimes send it for for inpatients, but it, we won't really know the answer until their adverse effect is is hopefully resolved. Um, they both have really good package inserts for what to do with dose adjustments, so definitely definitely check those out. Hand foot syndromes, somatitis, diarrhea, nail changes, photosensitivity, angina, um, all happen more commonly with both infusional 5-FU and capecitabine. Then, as we talked about, mucositis is really bad with bolus 5-FU. So, especially the older patients, so we will generally um, drop drop the boluses. Um, so, this really hasn't been used since uh, um, the, the third year fellows. Now, the first year Dr. Taylor had had to deal with this, and so occasionally the 5-FU is given continuously over 46 hours, and once in a while the pumps will break or give a overdose and so we have a uh, uridine um to uh um, uridine tracetate to 
as a um, antidote to help with these overdoses. This drug is not stocked. We can usually get it here within 14 hours. It's in Nashville, so we have it like flown overnight or flown during the day to get, get to us. And we'll start it as soon as it gets here. Um, I think last time we started it at, at two or three in the morning. Um, the sooner you can give this, the better. Um, so every six hours for 20 doses. Um, and then we'll like, generally we'll think about growth factor, especially if patients have been like highly treated with chemo before, if they've gotten radiation where they're a high risk for neutropenia, we'll think about growth factor as well. Um, this is a very rare problem, but, um, it will happen at these outlying sites um, as well. So like they'll they'll kind of refer to, to UW from clinics and such for this. Um, the last two cases that was an outside UW patient, the last one was from the VA, but. Okay. And then, yeah, just a summary of the pyramidine analogs. Um, let me see if there's anything. The, um, Cytarabine, um, this is part of the treatment plan, but cytarabine actually is excreted in tears, and so it can bother the eyes, and that's why we give prednisone drops for up to 48 hours after doses of cytarabine to prevent conjunctivitis. Um, as long as patients have good um, like administration technique, that's it, it's prevented very, very well. The, Anytime we've seen that be a problem, it's because uh, the at home they're not doing the drops correctly. And then gemcitabine, a, like a key thing, something that'll happen is like you'll have a little lady with a kind of a bad IV, a bad peripheral IV. And to get the drug in, nurses will slow down the infusion time to maybe 90 minutes or 120 minutes. And when that happens, um, there's a really, really high risk for myelosuppression. So these patients will come back next week and won't have any counts and you're wondering why. And then you can kind of look back at the notes and see that the, like the drug was given um, over two hours. Oops. Okay. Um, the hypomethylidine agents are, are last here, and so azacetidine is oral and um, IV sub Q. We don't like to give it IV because it only lasts for one hour, so it's a one hour, one hour beauty, and it's hard to get that drug to the clinic or the infusion center in the, in an hour. Um, sub Q is is really well tolerated. It's most patients don't even need to take antiemetics with sub Q therapy, whereas with IV they do. Um, most people tolerate sub-Q better, so it, it works pretty well. Um, definitely watch, like, the renal issues. We'll have um, UN rises that are unexplained um, with azacetidine, and we'll generally have to, you'll have to re reduce the dose. Um, you'll see UN go, you know, up over 100, actually. It just, it's not common, but it's something to watch for sure. And then rotating the sub-Q sites like you would with all um, uh, cancer, um, like sub-Q injections. Um, I have a large chart here. So the pharmacogenomics column, um, we talked about most of it, TPMD, DPYD. Um, MTHFR uh, is, has some evidence that uh, deficiency uh, leads to um, problems with methotrexate clearance, but it's it's not fully fully resolved. Recaptopurine, the, the age comment is generally for really old people. They don't, they can um, have problems tolerating. And by that, I'd be, I guess I shouldn't say really over, over 65. And usually there's other, other drugs that we're using for those patients nowadays, but, but really watch, watch caution with age. Um, high dose cytarabine is also an issue with age. So patients, um, even over 40, we have to start thinking about dose reductions. Um, the renal dosing guidance and hepatic dosing guidance is a little bit better for these drugs because they're they're more from the 70s, 80s, 90s um, instead of the 50s and 60s. Um, and then uh, let's see, 
yeah, drug drug interactions are less common with with these um, methotrexate would have the most drug drug interactions for sure, and those are screened every every day. But the other ones we have less concerns with. And that's the talk. Uh, I see Lisa's question on vitamin B six, and they're really um, it has been studied, and it, it didn't pan out for for vitamin B six. Um, I we don't have a lot of active trials currently for peripheral neuropathy, but any any time we do, we try to disseminate that information widely in the cancer center and get patients enrolled because essentially we we still need to study this problem with clinical trials.